Hi, guys. Um, we'll get started now, I guess. Uh, so my name is Lee Fior. Um, I started San Diego Digital Designers. That's why I'm standing here right now talking to you. Um, I also started uh, Cozy, which is a digital design and marketing shop. I'll talk about each of those things for just a minute, and then I'll get out of the way um, and let uh, these guys uh, talk to you next. Um, San Diego Digital Designers uh, is, well, show of hands, how many people here are not in San Diego Digital Designers yet? All right, punks. All right. Um, so it's uh, mostly a, it's an online community on Slack, and then we do meetups like this. I don't really think you're punks. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean that. Um, we've got something on the order of 465 designers in there, give or take, as of today. But even, I'm pretty psyched about this. Just a month ago when we did this talk, uh, we were at 408. So we've had a, a lot of growth in a pretty short, uh, kind of, we're blowing up right now. Um, there's a lot of activity. Uh, we've got stuff about jobs and tools and um, San Diego and um, we got Webflow represented in there. We got Nelson here. Nelson works for Webflow. Um, if you guys don't know what Webflow is, talk to Nelson. It's a fantastic tool for creating highly functional and beautiful websites. Uh, we do these events monthly and then once a month we're also doing like a meal. Just I'm trying to make uh, this group uh, sort of a counterpoint to all of the big industry events where everybody gets drunk and there's like thousands of people and it's real, it, it, for an introvert like me, it's just, it's overwhelming. So, you know, we've got these, these are the big deal events and then once a month we also do sort of just, let's eat over, let, let's get eggs and talk about our day. Um, and it's free, of course. So, you can go to sddd.org if you have not already. Um, I'm just going to hit the space bar. Uh, cozy. Um, I won't talk about this for too long, but so we're a digital design and marketing, digital design and marketing shop. We're based in South Park. Uh, the model is um, it's all contractors, and then I'm sort of the like I oversee everything. Um, and we have contractors we've been working with for years, and then others that kind of come and go. So a lot of what I'm doing is um, maintaining a wonderful vetted bench of trustworthy contractors. Um, so uh, the approach that, uh, that I've developed over time is, uh, we're calling it rational design. Um, so I, over time I've been, um, well, I've been frustrated looking at uh, we, our industry, uh, which has done a great job of being focused on the user with our user experiences, our user experience designers, our user interfaces, user, user, user. Um, and uh, I feel like we're, I feel like small business owners and just the business side in general could use a little bit of attention, a little bit of love. Um, I care about the user, of course. You know, I've been getting into arguments with people at companies for, for decades, kind of arguing for the user and, and, uh, and the UX side of things. But um, I talked to enough business owners who were f nervous, they were freaking out because they're good at whatever it is their business does, which is not the internet. And that, that, that's holding them back, and that sucks. I don't think that, I don't want to live in a world where like, everybody has to be making Squarespace sites or something. Um, so uh, what motivates me now is helping those business owners sort of uncork their, their potential and, and alleviate that anxiety. Um, and so for those kinds of business owners, they don't need to run through some ideal design process that like, feels really good and we can get up here and do pontificating talks about expensive things. Uh, they, they, need, they need us to listen to what, what their actual needs are on the ground right now and solve for those, uh, so those, those immediate needs and maybe we can get them some more revenue so that they can start the cycle going and they can invest in some more stuff. Um, I, love to, I love to crap on personas. Personas are fine, but like, I kind of feel like not, not everybody needs you know, a, a three-week $200,000 persona exercise or something like that. You know, like sometimes you can just sit down and write it down on Post-it notes and it's fine. Um, so I want there to be a rationale for everything uh, th that we're going to put into the into into scope, um, and so that th this all kind of sums up under this heading of rational design, where we're trying to do, like I was saying earlier, we're trying to do as little as possible, but but no less, um, and it does work. Um, so this is the same stats I showed last time, but like um, these are just kind of year-over-year numbers. It doesn't matter. The specifics don't really matter. But the point is that all these numbers are green. Like 
we were working with this client um, and you know, we showed results and their leads are up and they're making more money and they're doubling the size of their work with us this year. So it works. So um, as far as what, what's relevant here, I'm always looking for contractors for that bench. Contractors like, are like me. They're, sometimes they're available, sometimes they're not. So I, I want to know at least a couple of every kind of role. Um, so come and talk to me or hit me up uh, with the contact information I'll put up in a second. Uh, we, we work with businesses, one way to say it, that are, that are too big uh, not to have their own design or marketing department. Um, so funded, st recently funded startups or soon to be funded startups or kind of stagnating uh, middle-sized businesses that are maybe very tech focused and they for everybody there kind of realizes that when they show their, their mom their, their website, mom's not that happy with it, she doesn't understand it. Um, so there's, uh, so we are cozydesign.com. My email address is up there. Um, I should mention, by the way, this talk is being recorded. Um, it's also being live streamed. I don't know if anybody's watching right now, but hi. Three people? Cool. <laughs> <laughs> Worth all the effort, right? Um, and uh, I, think, I think that's it. So with that, I think I'll hand it over to Brent. Brent works for Blink, whose uh, lovely house we are in right now. Brent and Blink have been a fantastic partner for, for the group and for Cozy. I am a huge fan of this man and also the people that work in this building. Um, so I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Lee. Uh, hi, Mom. <laughs> and Lee's mom and Rachel's mom. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you heard Lee. Uh, my name is Brent Summers. I work for a company called Blink. We're a design studio. We've got a studio here with about 20 people, five studios around the nation. Our headquarters is in Seattle. Um, I won't belabor um, a whole bunch of stuff, but I do want to talk quickly about one of the things that I'm proudest of at Blink, and that's the fact that we have such a good community outreach program. And one of the ways that you can really see that demonstrated is in a conference that we organize called Convey UX. Um, I like to say it's the premier user experience conference on the West Coast. Yeah. Um, there's a card in your seat uh, that has a coupon code. Uh, so if you're interested in going to Convey UX, it's this March in Seattle. Uh, you can save $200 off a of registration with that coupon code, and then Blink's going to kick back 100 bucks to SDDD uh, as a way of saying thank you so that we can keep you know, the event stuff rolling. So yeah. <laughs> Um, so I, I want to play a quick video. It's just a, a quick glimpse um, of that event. We took this uh, footage last year uh, to promote our, the event in Boston, which is in September. Uh, I think you'll, you'll like it. Oh, and um, prices go up midnight tomorrow for, Blink, for Convey, so hurry. UX matters because design is in everything that we do. User experience matters because great products uh, and services can improve people's lives. User-centered design still needs a bit of a push in the world. So while it's known, we think we've got a role to play to really get that message out there. So researchers, designers, product managers, giving them a forum to meet other practitioners, to expand their ideas, to start having conversations. That gives us sort of a shot in the arm to go back and do cool things. Well, we've been doing Convey UX for seven years. We've always thought of it as a showcase for Seattle, where we also bring in really interesting people from all over the world. I love the vibe. I like being able to see all of the different companies and the different experiences. I sat in the VUI session connected aircraft, and then I went to an artificial intelligence session. I took tons of notes, I got a bunch of ideas. Magic happens when you put people together in the same room. I can have those hallway chats. You sit next to somebody new uh, over lunch and get to know what they're working on. Kind of fangirl to your favorite like person that's, you know, oh my god, you wrote that blog post, yay! Blink's expanding. We want to bring the energy and inspiration that we have here into different cities. We're gonna be doing an event this year in Boston. We're all in about bringing together people that are interested in user experience and just have fun. When you're a practitioner and it takes deep knowledge and continuous learning to keep up with your skill, it's in these in-person live sessions like Convey UX where you can really achieve that. 
So we can't bring ConveyUX everywhere, and that's why we're partnering with folks like San Diego Digital Designers to create community here in San Diego. Um, but if you are interested, we'd love to have you join us in Seattle. But tonight, we're in San Diego, and we're here to hear from Rachel Govin. Come on up. Did I say your name right? Close? All right. Correct it for the record, please. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming tonight. I'm Rachel Govin. And uh, thanks to Lee and Brent for putting all of this on. It's very nice when everything is done for you for an event. <laughs> it's lovely. Um, so just a little bit of kind of housekeeping stuff before we get started. Um, people often, when I do these workshops, feel very judged <laughs> and get very defensive over like what they struggle with on this topic of time management and organization and whatnot. Uh, so I just want to just clarify, this is judgment free. We all have our problems. I struggle with this myself. I was just telling somebody I like pulled my own stuff out for myself last week, so I get it. Um, I also have a tendency to talk straight through all the questions. So I know we only have an hour, um, and we'll have time for questions at the end. But if you have like something burning, just raise your hand and stop me. Um, you also, in front of you, have a little kind of workbook situation. Um, this is a tailored talk from a workshop that I give that's normally four hours. So this is a very condensed version of that. Feel free to follow along um, as we chat um, through today's presentation. Um, but I'm really hoping that you take some notes for yourself um, to take back with you and implement. Um, are we out? Do we, how many do we need? OK. Um, I think. Raise your hand if you need one, and Brent will. Two? <laughs> oh, good job. Those are perfect numbers. Um, all right, so that's housekeeping. Um, borrow a pen from your neighbor if you need it. Uh, but yes, who am I? I'm Rachel Govin. I am a productivity consultant right now. I found myself here in a very roundabout way, as most people find their careers. Um, I did public health research management for almost 10 years. Master's in public health, worked for federal government contractors, doing all of the structured process, things take 18 months, forever, whatnot. Um, constantly putting out fires. If I had fewer than six meetings in a day, it was a great day. So really forced to figure out how to manage time and projects while growing and trying to be a human being on that as well. So um, I left that career realizing I was a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> And I like logic and efficiency. Federal government is not their favorite thing. And so I just was looking for my next job and kind of realized that this part of my brain is really helpful for you brilliant idea people who are kind of just the idea people to get everyone started and then we'll put some process in place for that. So um, I would love to hear all about you guys, but we don't have time for that today. Um, so yeah, let's dive in. Um, the idea that I talk about is all about incremental change. Because of my public health background, um, behavior change is a thing I spend a lot of time talking about. Um, none of this is going to be like a wipe the slate clean, overhaul everything, do everything differently, because that's not how the brain works. And we all know probably how many have already failed on a New Year's resolution that they set three weeks ago. <laughs> that overhaul stuff just doesn't work. So it's how can I get you maybe an hour or two next week, and then the week after, and the week after that. So that's really meant to sustain that change and not just willy-nilly try and you know, throw caution to the wind, do everything differently, and then fall back into your old patterns. So it's really structured in a way that even if you fall off the bandwagon for a week, it's really easy to get back on. Um, so yeah, keep going. Um, the first thing I like to do is give people permission to reclaim ownership of your time. I think we all feel beholden a lot to other people, whether that's family or your clients or your boss or whatnot. Um, but I think a lot of our stress from time comes from us feeling like it isn't our own. And it's really important for me to give you guys permission to reclaim that. Um, so yeah. And then second is stop shitting all over yourself is probably one of my favorite quotes ever. Uh, it is all about the word should and how toxic it is. Um, I had a friend call me out on this. Uh, I was going through a difficult period and we connected and she said, do you know how often you're saying should? And I said, I have no idea. And then I paid attention and realized how many times I was saying it was not great. Um, so that I should go to the gym, I should eat better, I should have done that thing on my list, I should write that report, I should be you know, president, whatever. 
Um, that's fine, the list is endless. You'll always feel that way. Having goals and growth is great. However, when you say should, you're taking away from what you're actually doing. So when you say, I should have done this with my time, when in reality you worked probably quite hard on something all day or had a good, for a good night out with friends, that's valuable and that's what you should focus on. So it distracts from what you've done, uh, but it also is a really good clarifying point if you're constantly saying you should do something and you're regretting that you didn't do that should over something else, then you need to stop and prioritize that and figure out a way to make, that's clearly a strong desire, so pay attention to that and how often you're saying the words should. Um, so, permission to do that. Uh, so, this is just a quick two slides on why our brains make this harder, make time management and task execution harder than we want it to be. It really is our brain, guys. It's not just you. Um, so we all know emotional, rational, planner, doer. It's super ego for us psych majors. Um, and my favorite is actually the elephant in the writer. It is an analogy that a psychologist came up with that essentially says the elephant is the emotional piece of that puzzle and the writer is the rational logic side of it. Um, so the writer provides the direction and says, oh, we're gonna get from A to B and we're gonna go this route. However, if the elephant doesn't wanna go right, guess what, you're going left. And so it's really just this constant balance of the emotional and the rational side pushing and pulling. And some of us have more than one another. I'm sure all of you recognize one of those words on the right or the left <laughs> that spoke to you pretty quickly. Um, we just need to make sure that they're both aligned to accomplish the goal at hand. So if they're constantly at battle and they're not working towards the same thing, that's a problem. There's a way to have a balance to make sure that they work together to get you where you're going quickly. Um, this, I think, really applies in workplaces uh, in the sense that things you don't want to do but you have to do anyways, <laughs> uh, you have to find a way to make that work together because there's just always those things that are gonna fall off the list or priority list. Um, <clears throat> the other few things that our brains trick us in regards to is willpower, multitasking, and self-control. We're not good at this. Uh, willpower, I mean, how many times at the end of the day have you been like, oh my gosh, I'm brain dead, I can't do that, like every day this week. And so. There is, that's actually true. Like think of your brain as a battery and you cannot only recharge it at eight hours of sleep a night. So if you are planning your day in such a way that you're putting a ton of important stuff at the end, you really are out of brain power and you're literally setting yourself up to struggle when you don't need to. Um, and uh, multitasking isn't actually a thing. Uh, oops, sorry. Um, does anyone know the origin of that word? Awesome. Um, multitasking became a word when computers were being built and people were realizing, oh my gosh, these computers are working so fast, they're multitasking at doing all of these different programs, when in reality they're not running concurrently, they're running consecutively just fast enough that you think they're running multitasking like together. So if a computer can't do it, your brain is not going to either, so don't think that you can, and I will Staunchly argue anyone who says, in, like in a job interview, what, how well do you multitask? And I say, I don't. Don't do it. Your brain is it's not going to get through your day if you do. Uh, and then finally, um, self control. You only have so much, so spend it wisely. Um, I think that's all I need to say on that. It's basically the same. You have a, a meter at the beginning of the day, and self control, willpower, multitasking, all of it just depletes it super quickly. So what we're gonna talk about next is how to structure and manage your time and your to-do list to work with these things and not constantly fight against it. So kind of just stepping back to think about how you guys are working to make sure that that's actually what's serving you best. Um, so everyone's here, let's manage your time. Uh, easier said than done. Uh, and there's so many ways to do that. I, I am gonna say, I'm gonna share a couple of my favorite ways to do these things. If none of this resonates with you, come talk to me after. I have. 52 other ways to talk to you about this. These are just kind of the common ones that I think um, typically resonate with most people. Um, but there's, there's a lot of wrong ways, there's no right way. <laughs> um, so just a reminder that there's actually a lot more time in your day and week than we think there is. Um, the fun fact, for Michigan I have to say this, Henry Ford uh, basically put out this 
eight, 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 eight hours of labor, eight hours of recreation, and eight hours of sleep. He really, during the Industrial Revolution, changed the workday to be eight hours. That was like the major thing. But when you split up the sleep time, okay, how much time is left for recreation? It's actually, you know, eight, 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 give or take a little bit of that proportion, um, which equals out to 168 hours in the week. And so 56 hours per bucket of these things. Um, and I read the book called 168 Hours with some byline. It's fantastic. I would read it if I were you. Um, and I kind of just stopped and thought to myself, so I sleep a lot. That's fine. I probably sleep 56 hours a week. That's great. I work about that. But where do those other 56 hours go? I really was like kind of offended by at myself <laughs> of not understanding, A, where my time was spent, but B, realizing how much there was to be used for something. So it kind of just really helped me frame where I'm spending my time and being intentional about that, but also to acknowledge like there is time in your day to do the things you want to do. You just have to set your day up and your week up in a way to make that happen. Um, so, um, great. And you can't recycle wasted time. So I like to drive this point home that we you can't recycle it. It's the only finite resource you have. You can find more people, more paper, more money, more whatever. You cannot find more time. Those last five minutes we spent, they're gone. So if we aren't intentional about how we are spending those 56, 56, 56 um, in our week, um, it's going to be a problem. And this comes into play. Human beings are terrible at underestimating how long things will take. Just atrocious. And it's a problem when we're planning things or committing to things. Um, for instance, there was uh, somebody did research in a university and said, hey class, will you do a timeline to plan out the end of your semester thesis or whatever it is, uh, some big paper. And so they were on average 30 days, they thought they could get it done 30 days faster than they could. 30 days, that's a whole month, that's like a third of the semester. <laughs> And they just like had this great idea of it will only take me 10 hours to research these things and then I'll do that and then I'll do that. And that's just not how things play out. Um, so understanding that the first time you try and plan out a project or day or something, rewind, go back, do it again, and really try and be realistic, add in your buffer time. We just want, and it's you know well-intentioned, we want things to take less time than they do. Um, it's also why you all overcommit because you all think things take a lot less time than they do, so of course I have an extra 10 hours to help you put on that event or volunteer with your organization. And that's great, make time if that's what you want it to be, but if you are taking on extra projects at work and you're constantly feeling stressed, or if you're an entrepreneur and you're taking on too many clients, it's probably because you're underestimating how long all of this stuff's really gonna take. Um, so again, we're, the reality is we're just not all that effective with our time, so it's really setting up your day and your structure and your process to make sure that you're serving yourself best. Um, so there's that. So a couple methods to like really hone in on managing your time is, <clears throat> and we'll talk about um, knowing where your time goes and then like tracking your time and distractions in a moment. It's like the cart before the horse situation always in my presentations. I never know what, where to start. But today we're gonna start with time management. And so who's heard of the Pomodoro method? Oh, a great handful of folks. Um, so I know I like don't have endurance after like a long week of constant meetings, introductions, whatever, like, Friday comes and I say, oh my gosh, or even Saturday morning when I'm like fresh brained, I just sit and think about one thing for more than 10 minutes. It's a real struggle because I don't have the endurance. I'm used to, you know, jumping around and, and going back and forth. Pomodoro method was um, actually some college student in Italy. His mom sent him a little tomato kitchen timer for school to like focus on things. And Pomodoro means tomato in uh, Italian. So it's really that basic. And the intention is that you set a timer, whether or not you have a fancy little timer, I don't know. Your phone is just fine. Set yourself a timer for 25 minutes and you do nothing else but that one task that you want to do for 25 minutes. Then you get your five minute break, set it for another 25 minutes, then you get your five minutes. So that five minutes is to get your snack, go to the bathroom, check your phone, Slack, email, all of that stuff. But that 25 minutes is you saying, I'm focusing on nothing else but this one thing. Nothing else matters in these 25, like 
barring the like building bringing down, like that's fine. But this is your focus time, and you can do 25 minutes. If it's a real struggle, start with 15, um, and then just work your way up um, to make sure that like when your brain jumps, oh, I should be doing that, or I should check my email or something. No, for 25 minutes, that can wait, and it's just this like nice little like ending time. There is a actual stop time of then I'll deal with all those things that clog my brain, but for 25 minutes, I'm only gonna do this. It's remarkable what you can get done in a focused 25 minutes. <laughs> if you're turning off all of the things and not being pulled in a bunch of directions, um, it's, you, it's time to deep dive and to think and to process. Um, and if you do that a couple of times a day, it's, I promise you're already gonna get your hour or two back next week, just alone with that. Um, so tracking your time, I feel very strongly about this, partially because I came from a world where I had to report my time in six minute increments, so I knew exactly where all my time went in like a disturbing kind of level. Um, but the only way that I could accurately plan out our research projects and budget for these things is knowing how long things actually took. And I think the underestimation is a good example, doing the budgeting in six minute time increments for my team and how long a weekly meeting with our client, like it's just an hour a week, right? Should be quick, a couple hours, maybe half an hour prep, whatever. No, it was like 15 hours of staff time for a weekly 30, 60 minute meeting. And so like in reality, I think, oh, I can take on all those other things because like I only have six meetings this week, that's easy. But these things just take so much more time. So tracking my time knew that it, you know, that email took 20 minutes, then we had to prep, and then we had to do all sorts of stuff. So um, it seems tedious, but if you don't know where you spend your time, you cannot make an informed decision on what to change and know what's working. If you're gonna pull a lever, you have to know which one you wanna pull and what that impact was. Um, research or data can't get away, but if you guys don't know where your time is going, I, it's hard to, help you understand what you need to change. And it really enlightens you on the extra time things take. Like, I, if you start a timer for every time you're just on email, you'll be alarmed at how many hours a day you spend on email, and that time you don't consider when you're factoring into all sorts of stuff. Um, so definitely, for a whole lot of reasons, know where your time goes. Um, you, there's um, a great app called Toggle, anyone familiar? T-O-G-G-L, uh, total game changer. It's like a stopwatch that you like create labels for and you just hit start and stop, start and stop. It's a phone app, a web browser, and a desktop app for your laptop. So you, anywhere you go, you can be <laughs> tracking your time. Um, and then it gives really great reports at the end. So even if you're like super broad of like email, work, cooking, whatever it is that you're trying to get better at, if you're just trying to get better at work, then just break that down however your day looks. But use Toggle. If you use it for just next week, I think you'll be like, oh, that's where that time went. <laughs> or how much time you spend planning for things or driving. Um, I know I, um, when I started consulting, I spent so much time in my car and I started to track that and realize, oh, like, yes, I have 40 working hours, except two of those are, a day are spent in a car. So how do I allow and adjust for that? Um, if anyone prices their own uh, services or products or anything, you have to know the reality of the time that goes into it to accurately price that. Super important. Um, so within all of that, anyone familiar with block scheduling? A couple of people. Um, actually first introduced to block scheduling in seventh grade. It was great. Um, kids can't focus, and so to only have three classes to like sit down for two hours, it was like a great way for us to like actually learn something. Um, but as it relates to um, you as a human being, as a grown-up, block scheduling is a very, very helpful way to dictate the structure and skeleton of your week to then plug and play into what you're going to do and when. Um, so again, in the um, workbook, there should be a like table thing um, on one of the pages that breaks down block scheduling. This is a very old mocked-up example that I created just to give it kind of a visual. Um, I'm up early, you might not be. I'm also in bed quite early, so you might not be. Um, fix this to however you need your day to run, but the important pieces are in that worksheet, and that's the blocks that you need to put into your time. So again, we'll talk more about distraction, but one of the biggest distractors is email, text messages, Slack messages, if you manage social media accounts, those, all of that. 
those small tasks are what detract your attention. And every time you refocus on something, you lose on average 30 to 60 seconds to just refocus on what you're doing. And it, like, is this every Slack message worth that? Probably not. How many Slack messages did you say like was sent in that one thing in your group last week, last month? It's supposed to be a good thing. It's a great thing, yeah. intentionally. <laughs> but if, if I saw a notification every time something like that went through, and I'm like, ooh, that's more interesting than what I'm doing. Of course, I'm going to jump over there. Or you know, email is just this like awful habit that we feel very tied to. And I promise, unless any of you are brain surgeons, which there's one doctor in the back, I know that, but <laughs> outside of like someone's life depending on you, it can wait those 25 minutes for your Pomodoro timer, I promise. It will be okay. It's a complete change in your way of thinking as well as those around you, but it's great. Um, so you'll see the um, small emails and small tasks up top and at the end of the day. So 30 minutes, 60 minutes, 30 to 60 minutes, one to three times a day, depending on your needs, right? Like if you, are a huge communicator in your role, you might need four slots throughout the day. Um, if you don't, maybe beginning and end is just fine. Um, I encourage, there's all these philosophies out there, and many people are like, I don't check my email until noon. And that's great if you can do that. However, I can't do that, because if a meeting gets scheduled, like rescheduled or canceled, I need to know that. So I do spend mental effort on my email and small tasks every morning, because it oftentimes impacts my day. If that's not the case, save your fresh mind for something else. Um, so it's the small tasks, um, email, Slack message, social media, um, calling to make an appointment for something, or whatever that is, just the small things. Um, the productivity blocks are the most impactful, and this ties a bigger version of the Pomodoro method, is these productive times. So that is like, all notifications off. If you can be off the internet, do it. Phone in another room. I have sat down with my snacks, with my chargers, with I've gone to the restroom. I've done everything I need to do so that I can sit and focus for two or three hours. If you can do that two or three times a week for two to three hours, I think you'll get all of your big projects. The needle will move on all your big projects. It's those small things that really fill the gaps that you can't do. There's an analogy of um, big rocks and gravel. And if you fill a jar with gravel first, you can fit fewer big rocks into that jar. If you fill it completely with all the big rocks and then put gravel around it, you're going to have like four times as much big rocks in there. So that's what those productivity times are meant for is, I mean, I used to do this in an open office just like this, and I taped a piece of paper to the back of my chair, and I said, do not talk to me until 2 PM unless the building's on fire, and then please catch me. Um, but it's like it worked because, again, reclaim ownership of your time. People want their question answered right now, which is great. They need to do their job. I need to do my job so they can catch me in two hours. And guess what? Everyone always waited and caught me in two hours. Um, you can put a message on your Slack. You can put in your email signature if you need people to know Thursdays, I'm out. It's like my focus day. Email me before or after. Um, so there's plenty of ways to do that, but that is where you get serious about getting your work done. What are those bigger projects? How are you going to get it done? Um, when you do block off time like this, and what I can show you, I literally bought my 2019 handwritten planner, in case anyone's curious to look. Um, what I'll do at this time is during that productive time, I will list the tasks that I'm going to do. So instead of just saying, oh, focus on that client, I'll say, run that report, do the analytics for that, and then um, catch up on emails or copy edit those three articles. Like I will be very explicit about what's happening in that time to make sure that I am not trying to multitask or um, have to switch gears too many times. Um, so being very clear about that. And then, you know, on Tuesday, if I'm feeling stressed about all the things I have to do, I know I'm like, oh, well, you know, I, on uh, Wednesday and Friday, I set aside the time I know those are already accounted for. I can pause that thought and move on to the next. Um, so this is what scares people the most because they don't think they can make their calendar look like this. And again, my last job I had fewer, if I had fewer than six meetings a day, it was a great day. I could still find this once or twice a week. You just have to ask for it and then hold true to it and claim that ownership over that time. You know, people are like, oh, can I book over that? Do you want your budget? Do you want your meeting? You choose. And guess what? I always got my time. <laughs> um, so yeah, and then the... Uh, bigger thing that I don't think people appreciate when you're trying to energize yourself and find time and energy for your work is the recharge time. And it's time just for you to recharge. 
You may not be able to put it in the middle of a work day, but what are you doing once or twice a week to fill your bucket? We all have heard you can't pour from an empty cup. How are you filling your bucket? And if we have time at the very end, um, I have an exercise to figure out what those recharge activities should be based on your values. Um, but it is super important to do that. And I say that only because I've worked with a couple people who felt like they were wasting time doing certain things. One said, I go down this rabbit hole of watching all these, he worked in the music industry, he said, I'll go down three hours of YouTube videos and I'll learn all the things that'll be super exciting, but then I didn't get anything done. Well, then we come to find out when we did the values-based exercise that he loves learning and growth and that kind of thing. I was like, oh, so that's your recharge time. Don't feel badly about it. Just schedule it intentionally so that actually gives you energy and that's fun and you don't have to feel bad about it because it's actually productive for your work. Uh, and it could be nothing at all work-related. But for, for uh, two people in that workshop alone, it was, oh, like how I feel like I'm wasting my time is actually my recharge time. They just had to structure their days and their intentions about it differently. Um, the final thing is buffer time. Um, never, ever, ever schedule every minute of every day because that's not reality. If you can give times between meetings for things running over, running to the restroom, getting a snack, that's fine. Um, but it's also to catch the things that come up throughout the day. There's always going to be those tasks that are never on your task list that you can't wait till Friday to do that you have to fill. Something takes longer, great. Um, you have to drive or, you know, catch somebody, you know, Vera and I are having a great conversation after we walk out of a meeting room. Like, I want space for that. Um, so buffer time is really important um, and nobody really thinks about it. So you can't schedule every minute because then at 9.05 it's going to be off the rails and that's frustrating and does not feel good. Uh, so buffer your time and you'll be happy. Um, okay, so rescheduling because life, let's be honest, somebody just today asked me, well, what happens when, you know, you get thrown a wrench and you have to put out six fires in the middle of the day? you put out said fires throughout the day. But if you were erase something, whether a meeting or a task that you scheduled in your productive time, whether you have to move your entire productive block, if you erase it, replace it. Otherwise, it's going to be off your list forever, and it will never get done. So you have to make that choice. Is it important enough or not? Um, but again, say no. Reclaim ownership of your time. Uh, every time you say yes to something, you're saying no to something else. And so what is that? Stop and think, if I say yes to this, what am I saying no to? Is it more free time to spend with your friends and family? Is it your exercise time? Um, do you actually have the time? And you actually, like, yeah, that would be a really great thing for me to prioritize in my life. It might be, but if you stop before you say yes to agree to do anything and realize you have, there, it has to be a trade. You cannot get extra time. It's finite, right? Um, so say no or not right now. I can do that for you next week. Or it would be great. Um, you know, I really want to help you. I can't do that until next week, or I can't help you, but I know somebody who can. Let me see if they're open to the introduction. And so really just like, y it's not, you aren't saving the world. You all are great, but <laughs> you only have so much capacity. Um, and don't say yes to things to get you out of things you don't want to do. Um, that's that willpower and self-control piece coming back into play. It's so easy to be like, you know what, Lee, I would love to go get coffee with you on Thursday. Let me just like clear my afternoon of all the things I should be doing. No, don't do it. You have time for that in another day. Um, and then the feeling like a failure. Like all of this just doesn't go as planned regularly. Um, and that's fine. The point with these incremental changes and these small things is that if you don't do well this week, it's not unsettling to have to start again the next week. You're like, okay, that happened. I'm like, it's not far off from what I did, so I can just jump right back in. Um, but it's like, it feels really good to do stuff and really bad to not. So there's that. Um, so executing, that's time management. Any, we'll wait for questions. <laughs> uh, so, um, well, I guess, yeah. Questions on time, period, anything? I think it varies for every person. Like I think of one of my best friends who does not wake up before 
10. She is like, I don't talk to her until she's on her second cup of coffee. I just know these things. However, I'm up like five hours before her and have gotten through half my day and I'm like the most productive at 6.30 in the morning. Again, don't talk to her until lunch when she's had coffee. So she backloads her day. And so her favorite time to work is 7 p.m. to 11. That's her quiet time that she gets her work done. But she's not thinking clearly enough in the morning. So it's whenever you are freshest and have the space to do that, you, I heard you say that you don't have time to do that. I would argue that if you take 20 minutes to do it, you're actually gonna get more than that 20 minutes back because you have a plan. And because you're streamlined in what you're doing and you're intentionally being more effective with that time as opposed to being like, oh gosh, what am I doing? Okay, I can do that now, like, oh, this fire. If you spend the 20 minutes at the end of your day or your week, I, th I think you're gonna find really quickly that you get more than those 20 minutes back pretty quickly. Personally, I close out my day at the end of each day so that the next morning I know exactly what I didn't do the day before <laughs> and still have to do and can kind of set up, oh, do I have to get up early for a meeting? Do I have to look presentable or am I in my pajamas? Um, so anything like that, I like to close out my day while all the things are fresh in my brain. So the next morning I'm like, oh, oh there's my plan, there's my list, I'm ready to go. I also do that on Friday for the following week. So I do not wake up Monday and plan my, my week. That's a waste of a Monday morning, in my opinion. I like to know on Friday, while well, it's fresh in my brain, what got done, what didn't get done, what ideas do I have, what whatever needs to happen to make sure it's all on my list. Um, but that takes me 10, 15 minutes, really, to like call through my to-do list, figure out, like collate my notes of like the various places I've put things and to get organized at the end of the day. Really, that 10 to 15 minutes, I save at least double of that the next morning by knowing exactly what I need to jump in and start doing. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other? All right, there'll be time at the end too. Um, so, executing. It's great to have a list and have the time to do said list. How do you actually do it? How do you actually get shit done? Um, so, the first and foremost is productive. Procrastination is a thing. Uh, I feel, I freaking love this comic. I like want it plastered on my wall somewhere. Um, I am a diligent doer. Like my number one strength on strength finders is discipline. Like this comes naturally to me and I'm like this pretty much every Friday. Um, so I get it. Um, but in the um, worksheet, I, just to save time, I'm not gonna quickly go in, I'm not gonna deep dive into any of the four reasons, but there are four primary reasons why you procrastinate. And identifying what it is that you naturally tend to, towards or what task specific things fall into one of these four categories will help A, trigger you to be like, mm, I'm procrastinating, and then B, fight against it. So it's low self-confidence, it's pretty self-explanatory. If you don't feel confident doing a task, it's gonna be harder to get started. Um, if you don't like it, if it's unpleasurable, then why, that's like counterintuitive. Distractibility, we'll talk about distraction techniques in a moment, but if you are distracted, you are just always gonna be thinking about the next and four hours has passed and you've not done the thing. And then distant deadlines, that's the one I will mention, um, kind of like that research project that took 30 extra days <laughs> from all those people. Um, distant deadlines, something called Parkinson's Law, that it's, things will take the space you give them. And so if you, I mean, how many of us went to college, had a term paper that you had all semester to write and waited till the last week? Yes, I did, myself. And it happens because I'm like, oh, I have all the time in the world to do that. Oh, it's only September, that's not due till December. Yeah, real life, then December's there and you're pulling all-nighters. Um, so yes, you might, that dis distant deadline may not go anywhere. You may have three months to do that report. But if you struggle and are gonna procrastinate that, how can you combat that? You can break that down into smaller deadlines and find a way to hold yourself accountable or tell somebody else that you're accountable to. I'm gonna send you a draft in a month. If I don't have this draft to you, like kick me because I don't wanna wait until the very end. So it's just like, how do you trick your brain to backtrack onto those things um, to make that easier for you? So everyone procrastinates to some extent. If somebody says they don't, they're lying. And it's just a matter of the high performers procrastinating, not procrastinating on the important things. Um, so again, those big rocks, the, don't focus on the gravel, procrastinate that, that's fine. Um, but do not, really high performing, executing people just don't procrastinate on those um, big, hard things. Like the f brain is fresh in the morning, so if I always save my hardest, I, my productive time is almost always in the morning. Um, 
but if you're a night person, you might produce at night. But like those are the things where I'm like, I cannot procrastinate on that. If I don't do this, this will not get done, and that's a problem. Um, busy is not productive, period. Um, who's heard of productive procrastination? Handful of folks. Um, it is a really fun way to observe how you're working. Um, procrast pro productive procrastination is the act of being busy while still procrastinating on your most valuable tasks. So even though you're working eight to 10 hours a day, but you're getting no needles moved on any of the important work, you are productively procrastinating on your real work. You may be super busy and mark 30 things off your to-do list, that's great, but if those aren't the things that needed to get off the to-do list, and you've procrastinated on the two that did, what, why did you spend 10 hours doing that today? Um, so you, I will share, I productively procrastinate by cleaning and organizing, period. Uh, the other week, I reorganized my entire Evernote library, because that felt important. It was not. Um, I mean, it felt good, <laughs> but I was absolutely productively procrastinating on something. Um, I like alphabetized and categorized greeting cards in my box one couple months ago, because again, that felt really important at the time. It's not. I was just putting off doing something. So when I start to clean and organize, it's part of the reason I don't work well at home, is because I will always go do something. <laughs> in cleaning my apartment. So I know, and I know to tell people around me, when I start like getting over there and organizing your desk for you, if I, you know, if I start telling you I'm on color coding something, stop me, call me on it, and tell me, check yourself, because I know I'm gonna do it. So identifying your productive procrastination is not shaming, it's not anything, it's simply so that you can trigger yourself to get out of it faster. Because it's fine if you spend 15 minutes before you realize, hmm, Rachel, you're organizing your pantry. That's not important. As opposed to three hours later, my pantry is immaculate, but I've gotten nothing done. So I can, knowing that about myself, telling the people around me um, at a new job or new contract or whatever it is, to be like, when I start talking about how important it is <laughs> to like rename every file in the drive, back me up and tell me to do my job. Um, so does, does anyone like, oh my gosh, I know what my thing is? see a lot of, yeah. Is anyone else cleaning and organizing? Am I alone? Yeah, okay. Anyone feel comfortable sharing what theirs is? Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> you set up all the folders. She's, she talked about organizing and cleaning out email, which is also real. Anyone else want to share? Yeah? Yeah. Very specific, but I get it. <laughs> I get it. My <laughs> I'll wipe sit right next to my countertop. Um, so yeah, again, just spend some time thinking about where you typically go when you don't want to do things so that you can trigger yourself so you spend less time doing that thing. Again, we all procrastinate. It's going to happen to some extent. Know what that trigger is. And sometimes it's like, you know what? I need to be done today. It is like I'm capped. I'm zapped. I'm just going to go do my recharge, take a nap, eat a meal, and it's fine. Or sometimes you can be like, mm, nope, I'm gonna go put my timer on, do my Pomodoro method, and focus and get my work done. Um, so, highly recommend you all think about that. Tell the people around you so that they can recognize and you can all get more work done. Um, so distractions. I love a desk that looks like that, except nobody's ever does. Um, Cause there aren't even drawers, where do you put stuff? I don't know. Um, but to better execute anything, you are going to have to reduce the distractions. So we've already talked about the email, like the small task time. And if you can avoid doing all those things, that's a lot of distractions to go away. Um, I like to say distractions, look in the mirror. It's normally things we bring upon ourselves or set ourselves in an environment that we are just naturally around them. Um, so I will like shock everybody by saying, my number one recommendation for reducing distractions is turning off all your notifications, period. On your laptop and on your phone, turn them off. Maybe text messages come through, like my mom needs to know, like that's cool, like I'll get my text message, but like Facebook, Slack, I do not get Slack notifications to my phone, I do not get emails sent to my notifications on my phone, none of it. When I wake up in the morning and look at my phone, like I don't wanna be looking at Slack, I really don't. Like I need to start my day in a better way. Um, if I'm like lounging on the couch, I certainly don't need to see the junk email coming through my inbox because <laughs> I'm going to get stressed about that and then I'm going to go and clean it and like that's not helpful. Um, 
So there are many ways that you can do that like permanently or not at all, but the ones that come across your screen and like the right top corner of your laptop are almost more problematic than your phone ones because you can turn your phone upside down and put it on silent and that's fine. But it's the like I'm coding or deep in a report or up in Photoshop, like really focus on something and then you're like, oh, Lee's posted in SDDD, let's go take a look. That's great, we all wanna know what you have to say, but when we're not productively procrastinating <laughs> and it's up to me. Uh, and getting through my stuff. So that if you want to do nothing else but one thing to reduce your distractions, get rid of all your notifications. Again, it's like so mentally freeing. It, like, like that first week I was like, this is, like I felt like 10 pounds lighter. I was like, this is great. I only get to pay attention when I want to pay attention. <laughs> so my energy was much better there. Um, other ways we inter interrupt ourselves, um, social media is like a real big one. If you spend 10 minutes an hour on social media, that's, 80 minutes a day in an eight-hour workday, and that's six and a half hours in a week. That's almost a full workday that you spend mindlessly scrolling through Facebook or Instagram or whatever it is. Some people have to do that for the job. I get that. Maybe only be five minutes, but do you want three hours back to your week? I would. Like, puppy pictures can wait until the evening. Um, I'll also say that when you think you're taking a break and recharging by scrolling through Reddit or social media or whatever it is, it's not actually a mental break, because if you work on a screen all day, another screen is not registering to you as anything recuperative or relaxing or anything. Save that for later, take a walk, go talk to somebody in the kitchen, like divert your eyes from any kind of screen, because it's not actually recharging and actually is just wasting your time. Um, if you have an office door, close it. Uh, like, I'm not joking, I put a taped a piece of paper to the back of my chair, <laughs> like, do not disturb. Um, Email signatures and Slack notifications of like when people will be able to get back at you. If you have work problems and client, if you're you know contracting client problems of people wanting you to respond at 9 p.m. on a Tuesday in your email signature, it should say my communication hours are. Also write that into your contract, but <laughs> that's a separate note. Um, but yeah, just like set the like I'm starting something new, setting my expectations. Again, I'm not a brain surgeon; it will be fine. Um, the other. There's tons of Chrome extensions that you can use if you have to be on the internet, but always find yourself, you know, control T, opening a new tab and going to Reddit like I do. Um, there's Chrome extensions where you can prohibit certain websites. You can turn off like anything but three websites that you need to go to. There's a fantastic phone app, because I can't tell you how many times instinctively I just like pull to pick up my phone. And I stop myself and I'll put it down or whatever, but um, there's an app called Forest uh, that you can download. It's free, it's great. It's like a Pomodoro method, but prevents you from looking at your phone during said Pomodoro method. <laughs> um, and it's fun, you like build this mock forest and the longer you set the timer for, the bigger the tree is gonna get. And in the end, it somehow turns into real trees in the environment. But it's also really heartbreaking because if you touch your phone and go out of the app, it, you kill your tree. <laughs> like straight up, it like just wilts and dies, which, I don't like. So for me, if I'm having a week where I just keep picking up my phone, I'm just gonna turn on the Forest app and you can do like five, 10, 15 minutes. You, or you can do four hours if you really need to say, I cannot be on my phone today. Um, so I recommend those kinds of things. Again, setting the structure up around you to make it easier for you. Like you cannot force yourself to do all of this on your own diligently. I'm just gonna power through. Trick yourself to do all these things. Forest app is great. Um, all right. Um, yeah. When you say distractibility, yeah. Do you mean that your personality type is more prone to be distracted, or do you mean you have too much in your envir environment that will distract you? Both. So some people are, I call them shiny object people, where they're like, ooh, butterfly. Ooh, that's a new meme I have not seen. And like those, like that's a distractible personality. But there's also things in your environment, um, you know, if you manage 10 people and they're constantly revolving through your door, that's distractions that's gonna prevent you from doing the work that you're ultimately gonna procrastinate on, not necessarily because you didn't set the intention to do said work, but it's the things around you that just kept coming. You're gonna, ha that's gonna be put off now another day because you had to deal with your personal problems. So, so it, it can be both. Um, I think the, the personality one 
you have to try harder. The situational one, it's a lot easier to clear your environment or make those few small changes to clear the distraction, even just for an hour or two. Um, I think that was just a little bit easier to go. Um, so you're executing, you wanna get everything done. Uh, this is my way of doing it. Um, and again, I can show you my planner after if you're interested. I track my actually finished tasks divided by my planned tasks that I said I would get done and do like second grade math and figure out my percentage. So I do this Monday through Friday. So Mondays I'll have like 15 tasks, Fridays like four because I lose steam and I know that. Um, and then if I hit 80% at the end of the week, I reward myself with a pint of ice cream. So tomorrow night I should get my pint of ice cream. It's gonna be great. Um, and I say this just because at the, you know, I'm saying, oh, I said I'd get these 12 things done. Oh, I've already done eight, that's fine. No, there's like three small things that if I sat down for 30 minutes, put my timer on and did, I would get that done. And so it's just those small little things at the end of the day, how can I push myself just that little bit further to make sure that gets done at the end of the day and at the end of the week? Um, yeah, so this is like extra. Um, it's super easy on pen and paper. It's not always so easy depending on the electronic version you're using, um, but if you really struggle with this, hold yourself to some execution list of um, what you're gonna get done. Meetings, calls, task lists, um, like dinner with friends, like things that you need to do and want to do, um, just start tracking it. And again, like having the data of where your time goes to move those levers to figure out the right stuff. If you know what is working and what's not, you're gonna be in a much better system. I did this for, well, I do this every week, but there were two weeks in a row that I, did terrible, it was like 65% and I'm, that's not okay with me. <laughs> so I was able to look back at my data of my planner and say, why did that happen? And I realized very quickly that I had all my meetings in the morning because everyone wanted to do coffee. So that's a morning thing, right? And then I would put my productive time in the evenings or in afternoons and I've already told you, and I knew this about myself, I'm a morning person, I should flip those days. So because it, I had the data to look back at that, I was able to quick fix that in two weeks as opposed to, well, I don't know what's happening, like it kind of feels like this, maybe I'll do only two days of meetings in the morning. I was able to quickly be like, that is not how you work, you can do afternoon tea or Saturday. <laughs> um, so it tra again, just know your data um, and go for that. It's just really, what are the things that perpetually don't get crossed off your list? Because those are the things you either need to stop doing or delegate or really set yourself up, that's the first only thing I'm doing and tell somebody, Hey, I'm gonna do this by Tuesday morning. If I don't have that to you, please call me. <laughs> um, so that kind of stuff. Um, executing is truthfully all about habits and building good ones and breaking bad ones. Uh, so who knows mini habits? Anyone heard of that? Uh, you have? Yeah. Um, Stephen Guys wrote, I think he's written like four books on this at this point, um, but his original book is Mini Habits. Now there's mini habits to lose weight and do all sorts of stuff. But um, his website actually has a ton of great resources. It's Stephen Guise, G-U-I-S-E. Uh, his definition of a mini habit is a very small positive behavior that you force yourself to do every day because it's too small to fail. And his examples are if you, something that takes like 30 to 60 seconds. You, like, ha, like, you cannot fail at doing that. Like I could have the stomach flu and still do that one thing. Like how do I perpetually build that habit? Um, so like if your goal, if your newest resolution is to get uh, more exercise. Maybe you walk to the corner and back every night. Maybe you do one push-up. Reality, you're going to walk further and do more than one push-up. But if you can just train your brain to get there and do that, you're doing well. It takes on average 66 days to build a habit, like a small average habit. So normally we oh, it's been like, oh, it's been a month and I fell off. Like, that's too bad. You haven't even hit that 66 mark average yet. And so really jump back on that bandwagon and keep pushing and keep trying because it really takes us longer than we want it to to build or break a habit. But those mini micro habits are a really great way to start to do that. Um, it also means frequency over intensity matters more in building the habit. So if you, intensity is, you know, I want to get, I want to be more active. I'm going to go to the gym for one hour, five days a week. That's a lot of time that <laughs> you feel like you already don't have. Like, I don't know. And those are the things that typically, unfortunately, just go by the wayside. But if you did one push up every day, that's a frequent thing that you can definitely do because it's not super intense. So the frequency of that habit of consecutive days in a row is going to be far more impactful 
than something that's super intense. Um, maybe aging myself here a bit, but that's okay. Uh, Jerry Seinfeld is famous for saying, don't break the chain. And what he means by that is, he was once asked in an interview, how do you always have, and this is back when he, like his heyday, but how do you always have good content? Like you are just constantly coming out with new stuff. How do you always have great ideas? And he said, he writes new material every single day. It doesn't have to be good, it doesn't have to make sense, it doesn't have to be anything, but the act of sitting down, and I don't even think it was much time, I think it was like 15 or 20 minutes, but it, he just sat down every day with a pen and paper and wrote every single day. And so he put it on a calendar, kind of like that, if you put an X, X after X after X, starts to look like a chain, like a chain link fence. Um, and so when he would get to a day where he just didn't feel like it, he would look at that physically in front of him and be like, if I don't do that, then there's like a hole in my chain and I have to start all over again. And so that's the impetus to say, I'm just gonna sit down and do my mini habit and write for the day. Um, you can download these super basic calendar templates online for free, print one out, it's great. I encourage you to put them where other people can see them and have that accountability. Um, I would be like, hey, you know, looks like you've done a lot of things a lot of days in the row. What are you working on? And you'd be like, I'm writing my new stand-up comedy. And it's going to be great. Uh, so it's like that, it's that easy. I will say this was one of my clients. <clears throat> she wanted to do more walks. And you can see her little sad face for the day that she didn't get it. Um, but that was like two straight months where she, and she had this in her kitchen because somebody would say, or, you know, that social accountability and embarrassment of people coming over and being like, oh, you did so good last week, or what's happening this week? Um, what you don't see is June, which did not go so well. But um, that's two weeks of a habit of building something and doing something she set her mind out to do that she was able to do. Um, she used stickers, you can do whatever you want, but these printable things are like free on the internet for, they're super easy. But again, this just drives home frequency over intensity. And what is that trigger to make sure you're actually going to do that thing? There has to be a visual cue. There, like, otherwise, your brain's just naturally going to prioritize all the other things. You're going to have more conversations. Then a week's going to go by and be like, dang, I haven't taken a walk this week. Um, I actually made one, like a habit tracker for myself um, for the new year. And I took a picture of that. I did not get it in these slides. But if you want to see it, I'd be happy to show it to you. Um, but again, it's like I catch myself at the end of the day being, Oh gosh, I, one of my things is to eat one fruit and one vegetable a day. <laughs> Just kind of basic, but to me, a struggle. And so last night it was, you know, nine o'clock. Oh, I haven't gotten my fruit yet today. I want to put that mark on that one. So I, and I ate an apple before I went to bed. It's just those little things that like, it wasn't a big deal, but it is a big deal because then I can look at that line and say, I've gotten my fruit and vegetable every day for two weeks straight. Mom would be proud. Um, so, uh, all right, I want to be respectful here. Um, all of this to say, focus on yourself, turn it inward, understand how you're working, why you're doing it that way, is that working? Um, set calendar reminders and alarms and all of the things uh, to set a conducive environment for what you're working on. Know your triggers, know your challenges, know your productive procrastination. Just like really reflect on that a lot and that incremental change will happen so quickly. Um, so to-do lists, I know, is like half the struggle of figuring out what to do and when to do it. Um, and I, again, there's a million different ways to do this. There's so many apps. Again, I'm a paper pencil kind of person. Um, I also have a really great erasable pen for those who are also paper and pen people <laughs> but can't handle the like crossed out erase marks. I got you. Um, but the only thing I feel super strongly about on to-do lists is that you only have one. If you have a work one and a personal one, or by project, or um, I have some on Post-it notes and some in this app and some on my calendar, you are never, ever going to get a full picture of what you have to do and how to prioritize that stacked against everything else. You just aren't. Um, so like, I'm queen of sending myself emails. I think earlier I sent myself three emails just from the networking here before this. Like, remember to do this. Send that person that thing. And when it's in my email inbox, I can then transfer it tomorrow morning quickly to my to-do list. But I'll have a day of meetings, and I'll go back through my written notes and put things on my to-do list. Like the 15 minutes at the end of my day is that kind of stuff to collate everything into one spot. Because otherwise, I'll have a list, and I won't look at it for four days and be like, shoot, I forgot that that big thing had to get done. Oops. Um, and so to avoid that, just have one giant master to-do list. Um, there's great ways to prioritize your to-do list. 
which is I think also what people struggle with is they just look at it and get paralyzed of there's 57 things on here, I don't know what to do first. Um, this is one strategy that I really like. I did put this um, here on your paper because I, you know, you can sit down and do this with your team, pull everyone's to-do list, put each one on a post-it note and delegate, like figure out where it fits on here and do your work. Do that for yourself personally. Um, it's a really great way to identify the things I want to do but really aren't gonna move that needle, that productive procrastination stuff, um, versus like what is urgent and important that I have to prioritize this week. And if you think, start to think about these things, um, A, you'll put fewer things on your to-do list, but B, uh, you'll get the important things done and you'll know what to prioritize. I also put a couple questions in there as well to ask yourself as prompts of what to do on your to-do list. If you could do three things only today, what would it be? What tasks have an impact that lasts beyond today or this week or this month? Like what are those big rock ones um, that can move the needles? And does this task have a higher return? than my other tasks. And so you have to answer those truthfully for yourself. But again, I don't think many of us step back to challenge how we're working and why we're working and what it is. It's just in front of us and we trudge through and just do and do and do. Um, so take the emotions out of your to-do list, be brutal and slashing things and putting them not in the number one do column. Um, it's very easy to be like, everything I do is important. I wouldn't do it if it wasn't. Fair, however, you aren't getting all the things done. You are a human being. So how can you prioritize that? Not saying that these things aren't important and they don't need to get done. Maybe you delegate it. Maybe that's your side project. What, there's a million different ways. But you have to prioritize your to-do list. Um, you can number. You can highlight. You can color code. There's like a whole bunch of different ways that you can do it. But I find it helpful to have a framework of this one item. Where does it fall? Is it urgent and important? And that kind of thing. Um, this is, I've already talked about when I answered your question. It's just a process in this incremental change, day after day, week after week, month after month. You, you have your plan, that's great. We're all gonna leave here with something, we're gonna go do it. You go execute it this week and next. Uh, at the end of that week, you'll review and be like, how did that go? What can I tweak? Did that work for me? Do I need to change? Um, and then you pivot and it's, again, day after day, week after week, month after month. It's that incremental change. Um, <clears throat> so I think I've already told you how I wrap up my week, but you, just brain dump at the end of every day, and I promise your next day will start way better. It um, doesn't even have to be organized, pretty, whatever. You just brain dump at the end of every day. I think you'll put yourself off to a great start. Um, do we have, how much time do we have? No specific amount of time. OK. You guys have like five minutes, five minutes, a little bit? OK. Uh, this much? Yes. <laughs> this much. All right, I'll, I'll go through this quickly and um, just to set you guys up with the exercise. Uh, who here knows what their core values are? Who's done one of those exercises? Like very few people. Okay, great. Um, if you haven't done it in like five plus years, do it again. Um, but the idea of self-care, which I always hesitate whether to talk about it or not, but it comes back to that recharge time and you cannot, like you literally don't get your phone to empty. So why are you letting yourself you know, run on fumes. Um, it's a priority, that's why it's part of your block scheduling time. Um, and it's on emphasis on flourishing and not surviving. It's very much a buzzword right now, which it's like, I'm gonna go get avocado toast and a manicure. Like, cool, that might be self-care for you. It's not for me. Um, so understanding what it is that you can call self-care that's going to really impact your energy level and make you excited for the next day and have that space um, to get work done. Um, so um, there is a little bit of space in the workbook for this. If, I will leave this up for a little bit. I'll put it back at the end um, as like the final slide in case somebody wants to sit around and do this. You can find li these lists all over the internet. This is one version um, of it. The whole idea is you take, um, read through this list and whatever jumps out to you that like that speaks to your soul, write it down. 10, 15, doesn't matter, a lot. You're gonna have a lot in that first round. Then you ignore this list and you look at your list of 10 or 15 and you pare it down to five or six. And then you pare it down to three, maybe four. Um, you'll, you'll start to see themes, like you'll have picked five values that kind of fit under one umbrella. It may be easy just to choose that one word that best describes all of that and you know that it's fairly all encompassing, right? 
Um, when you have your three to four personal values, and mine are health, freedom, and honesty, if we can just be transparent here, um, health, freedom, and honesty, none of that is avocado toast in a manicure. It's just not. And that's what Instagram tells me I'm supposed to do for self-care. And so it's just this, like, not, it just does one of these. It just doesn't work. Um, which I was wondering why I was always exhausted and didn't have the <laughs> energy to like go about what I wanted to do. And it's because I was doing the wrong self-care. Um, so there's a lot of different types of self-care. Um, these two Instagram accounts, if this is something you struggle with, fully recommend. I love them, they're great. Um, but there's physical, emotional, social, and spiritual. And so I think a lot of us think very narrowly in what self-care might be. And I think we need to broaden it. Sometimes, for those of you who aren't uh, orderly, productive procrastinators, sometimes you just need to clean your house. Like, and that is self-care, because that's gonna make your week easier. You can find things, you're not arguing with your kids of where their shoes are, whatever the case may be. Um, like, these things that we just don't think of self-care. Um, sometimes I, it's like preschool, like I need to eat a snack and take a nap. I just do, like, that's what I need to do. Um, so just thinking of it in these different realms, um, I think, you know, yoga and rest, those are kind of common ones, but, if you are an extrovert who loves connection and community and you haven't seen friends in two weeks, like you're gonna be craving that. You're gonna need that to get going. Again, fellow introvert, not my scene, but for those of you who have that social bone in your body, um, that might be it. But for those of us that are introverts, um, and uh, a good friend of mine, she's a people pleaser, so hers is setting boundaries. She feels awful when she just says yes to everything and does everything for everyone else. And for her, it's hard. It's not easy, feel-good self-care for her. But ultimately, it's what she needs to do is to say, I don't have capacity for that. I can do that next week. Or a really ex ex draining friend calls, and she'll, I, you know, stop and say, ask her if you have space for this. Because, <laughs> like, you can call tomorrow. It's not a crisis. Um, anyways, just a lot of ways to think about self-care. Um, Check your values and match them to that. Um, so I guess some other examples. Um, what's somebody's core value? Let's do this. Core value, anyone know? Community? Yeah, so a self-care for you isn't gonna be sitting at home and Netflix, Netflix by yourself. That's not community. You're gonna wanna join a book club or come to events like this um, or you know, set a Friday game night with your friends. Like Those are the things that to some people sound exhausting and to others are like, this is gonna make my day tomorrow, like, I'm ready to go. I have all the ideas, it's gonna be great. Um, so, it's another one. Authenticity, I like that one. That one's come up quite a few times. Um, and self-care with that, it kind of ties to me in the honesty thing of, t like, what is that truth? And being honest with yourself self about that, um, but then also being honest with others. So. If you're constantly self-doubting and have that imposter sister, that's not really authentic, is it? Or like, I wanna get crazy and dye my hair pink. You can't, like self-care is just owning that and doing that, and it's not, but so-and-so, no. Ain't nobody got time for that. That's you, that do you, that's fine. For me with honesty, which I think ties into authenticity a bit, is the difficult conversations. Um, so many people would never consider difficult conversations part of self-care, but for me, if I have something in the back of my head that's bothering me because a friend and I haven't connected and resolved an issue, I will be able to do nothing until I resolve that and put my thoughts out there. All my people will tell you I'm like super blunt and straightforward, and it's because I expect that of people with me because I like an honest world. Don't tell me it was something with hidden meaning. Passive-aggressive people are not in my life. I can't. And but that's my self-care is to like create that boundary of like, oh, that's your style. Like, I'm gonna keep you at arm's distance because you're great, you're fun. However, that's so draining for me. Um, so yeah, it's just thinking about it in a very different way. If I'm happy um, to chat after, if you're struggling to come up with a value with an associated self-care exercise, email me, my website's everywhere, and I think my email's at the bottom of that um, sheet as well. But this is like something that if you're gonna be good with your time and executing and pushing yourself and building habits, you have to have the recharge button ready to go. So it's important to me that everyone knows their thing. Um, but that's that. Um, and so go, yeah, right? Uh, yeah, there's space in the workbook. And I, if you could take like a 30 second, hot second right now to think about what it is that you uh, learned today or thought about today that you could do tomorrow or start Monday. Um, like what are the things that you're like, it, just one, no more than three, let's say that. Um, 
what's something that you can do? Like, are you gonna download Toggle to track your time? Are you gonna download Forest or set your timer? Um, merge your to-do lists, is that now a to-do list item? <laughs> to merge all your lists? Um, just think about the like one or two things that really resonated with you that you can take home and do. Um, so when you're cleaning out your bag and you find this, you're like, oh yeah, I went to that event and something happened and I can do something about it. Um, but yeah, I just wanna say go forth and conquer today. Um, oh, I actually have. If you need help choosing what to go do, there you are. I did, did the homework for you. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs>